This is Duke University. Okay, but to finish up, what I want to now uh, come down the final stretch here and tell you about why do we have the Duke Canine Cognition Center? Um, and there's so many reasons. Um, and of course, we're very, very excited to be able to study dogs. And, and it's also very unique that we have a Duke Canine Cognition Center, and, I'm, and it's actually located in the evolutionary anthropology program. You can imagine how many times I've had to answer the question, wait, you study human evolution, but you have a dog center. Um, I, don't, I don't get the connection here. So hopefully I can help you. All right, so first of all, we have over 900 owners um, uh, who have signed up to, uh, or I should say parents, who have signed up to volunteer time to bring their dogs in and play fun games with us. And we're gonna get Stella, who's actually from the uh, eyes, ears, nose, and paws in a few minutes here uh, to come demonstrate a couple of the tests that we play. Uh, and so you can root for her. Um, but uh, basically, instead of me having uh, five or six monkeys in cages that I study for a 30 year period or whatever, I am really excited because I can have dogs, I can have thousands of them, I can have a big sample of animals. They don't live at Duke, they live in people's homes, they're very happy, they can come in, I can play fun games with them and they can go home. Um, and so, uh, and not only that, but because dogs are very busy people, I don't know if you know this, um, during, during the recession, there actually was a major hiring splurge on dogs. Um, uh, one of the fastest growing parts of the economy was one, the pet industry, and two, the, while you know, we were having trouble uh, keeping jobs, dogs were actually in greater demand than ever. Um, so what we're trying to do is help dogs do their job better by learning how their psychology works. Um, and the, our system is essentially like what happens with developmental psychologists who bring their children, you know, children, sorry, parents bring their children in to be tested, and it's the exact same thing. Okay. So the reason I got started in this is because I was 19 years old. I went to my advisor at Emory University, Mike Tomasello, who was actually a Duke alum, uh, and I said to him, uh, look, we've been playing this game right here, uh, where th imagine this is me, not the cute little anime girl. Um, and I'm pointing uh, to this cup instead of this cup, and I'm trying to tell a chimpanzee or a bonobo where something is. Now, I promised you in the beginning that really what I'm interested in is in what is it that makes us human. But then I went off to tell you about this um, comparison of bonobos and chimps and lethal aggression and risk taking, et cetera, and how they're similar to us. But we've also discovered ways in which we're really different. And this is one of those ways, because it ends up that using gestural communication is one of the very first things that emerges incredibly early in our species. And I've just, uh, I've just uh, observed this in my own daughter. Between nine and 12 months old, social cognitive abilities come online that don't start developing in other great apes, chimps and bonobos in particular, till they're five or six years old. So we have this an amazing early emergence of social skills. And put on top of that, that when we're born, our brain is only 25% developed. Yet theirs is somewhere between 50 and 60% developed. So something crazy is going on with human brain development. And this is one of the first phenomenon that was observed to, un, to reveal what I just described to you, which is that if you point to one of two cups that has food in it, and basically um, you're just trying to help the chimpanzee or bonobo find the food, it's, it's over here, they are horrible at this. I've spent weeks of my life trying to helpfully tell chimpanzees and bonobos where food is. Um, you know, it's there, it's there, okay? And you can give them lots and lots of repetitions. They finally can slowly learn it, but then if you just do something slightly different, it completely throws them apart. I mean, they fall apart. Young kids between nine and 12 months old, and especially by 14 months old, are masters of this game. Mike Thomas all had said to me, the reason that I've spent, sent you out to study chimpanzees and spend weeks and weeks being really frustrated with them completely failing something so elementary is because we think this is really important as sort of the foundation of human social cognition that leads to language, that leads to culture, and we think this has uniquely evolved in our species. And I said, uniquely? And he, and he said, yeah, 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 only humans. And I'm like, well, I think my dog does that. Um, and so, and so, so, so he said, ah, yeah, yeah, and of course he didn't have a dog, and, and he actually had never had a dog. And so he said, ah, oh, you know, everybody's dog does calculus, and da, 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 da. And I said, no, no, seriously, Mike, my dog does that, I'm sure, okay? So I'm 19 arguing with like this permanent scholar or whatever, and he was fantastic, but he said, okay, let's do an experiment. You know, if you're so sure, let's do an experiment. So we did, and um, you know, the punchline is, we went and did the same game with dogs, and they are masterful. Um, they spontaneously solve these problems. Um, even the youngest puppy, regardless of whether they've been raised by humans or not, 
spontaneously are able to use human gestures. Wolves are not very good at this. Um, and it seems to be something that is a product of um, domestication because I went to Siberia and studied some experimentally domesticated foxes and they actually show the same skill after 50 years of artificial selection simply based on whether they were aggressive or not towards humans. So basically, really nice foxes get smarter. Um, and so we were able to show that this is a result of domestication. Uh, and remember, I want to understand how is it that you have cognitive changes that might be important for humans. Okay, now you can see why we have dogs in the Department of Evolutionary Anthropology. Okay, so what we find when we test dogs is this is really easy. I can just look to where the food is. That's easy for dogs relative to other animals. And then here's a funny one where we do something they've never ever seen before because presumably, you know, anybody who has had a dog and you're a human so you can't help but communicate this way or look to where you're trying to communicate with somebody. But we do something like this where we put a block on where the food is. No problem, this is really easy for them. And of course we do olfactory controls where we give them no information at all and what we found is they guess randomly. And um, the only thing we're interested in is their first choice. So we only give them one choice. They don't get to go back and forth searching. They have to go directly to where they think it is. Because they could use their nose if we, if, if we let them sniff it out, of course, eventually they could find it. But what we're interested in is where do they go first? All right. So I think what I want to do now is, um, I guess I'll just show you, um, let's, let's work with Stella now. Why not? All right, let's bring Stella up here. And let me introduce. Uh, ears, nose, and, or sorry, eyes, ears, nose, and paws. And um, I'm going to let Deb here introduce herself and just tell you a little bit about Stella and what she's been trained to do. Because I have to say that, first of all, one of the most fun things I did is I did their graduation uh, uh, commencement, or I guess speech or whatever, uh, for their first graduating class. And usually I think if you give a graduation lecture, you're really, really worried about are the kids gonna go out and be you know, the best and are they gonna really do the right thing and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, this is easy, they're dogs. Of course they're gonna do the right thing. So that was easy. Um, and then, of course, I also, having not been involved in the service dog um, uh, um, uh, you know, business, uh, I had never seen the effect that these dogs would have on people's lives. And I was just shocked when I saw the, um, uh, you know, the, the future owners of the dogs that had just graduated come and tell the story of how these dogs absolutely changed their lives. So let me just introduce Deb. And Deb actually works locally here in Carborough. And the big problem we have, and the reason we're trying to study dog cognition is to help her and other organizations like hers get better at producing dogs faster because we have a huge supply problem. And I can't wait until he uh, finishes that study and gives me all the answers I need. Um, my name is Deb Cunningham, and I'm with Eyes, Ears, Nose, and Paws. I'm the program director, and uh, with me is Stella. Uh, Stella is one of our uh, dogs that's getting ready to graduate, um, and we hope to graduate her in June, on June 23rd. Um, we have, as Brian mentioned, we have a graduation ceremony to uh, welcome uh, the new teams out into the community. Um, it's open to the public, and if you guys live here locally or happen to be in town, we'd love to have you. Um, we did have Brian speak at our first, uh, our, uh, he was our keynote speaker for our first graduation. Um, and it so happens that we have another Duke professor who's going to be the uh, keynote speaker at uh, uh, this next graduation. Her name is Kathy Rudy, and she just recently published a book called Loving uh, Animals. Cool. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to put Stella on the spot. We did give her four warm-up trials before you guys got here. So what we did is we just told her that we're going to put food in one of these two buckets. That's all she's ever done. Um, and we're just going to test her, all right? So you guys cross your fingers for her that she represents her species well. And by the way, her parents are just there very nervous. All right, so all I'm going to do is I'm going to hide food in one of the two places. She won't know where, but she knows it's hidden. I'm just going to try to tell her where it is. That's all. All right, you guys know where I put it? OK, good. Oh, the poor chimpanzees. Okay, you want to do one more? Yeah. 
That is where it was. I should tell you. Yay. All right, one more. Ready? Oh, whoops. I need my sign. <laughs> Yeah, you guys know where it is? Yay, Stella. OK, now, <laughs> just to be sure, just to be sure. All right, do you guys want to do something? Do you guys want to give her a novel cue? I don't know what she'll do. But we can give her a strange cue. Do you want me to? I can point with my foot. You want me to do that? OK, let's see if she can do it. Now that, I'm sure, is not something she typically sees. I have no idea what she'll do. Let's find out. about to fall over. Go, Stella. Go. You can go. It's OK. There. OK. <laughs> you can go there. <laughs> OK. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. So that's interesting. So somebody said Clever Hans, which is right. Um, there's a horse that um, basically people thought could do calculus. Um, and then they did a controlled experiment. And they found out that the horse was using subtle cues that, the, that its trainer was giving off. And of course, it didn't do calculus at all. But Clever Hans gets a really bad rap. Because everybody's so disappointed that it didn't do calculus, the horse that didn't do calculus, that everybody forgets the horse had figured out how to trick everybody that it knew calculus. <laughs> I wish I could done that in school. Uh, and of course, how was Clever doing that? He, he was using subtle social cues given off by the human to figure out when to stop. And that's exactly what young humans are doing when they're trying to first figure out how to interact with adults and learn culturally. So what seems really stupid and unimpressive is actually what I would argue one of the crucial first steps to becoming human. Um, and so you don't see that in chimpanzees and bonobos, our closest relatives, but you do see it in dogs who are incredibly distant related to, distantly related to us, but you don't see it in wolves. So I think actually domestication is an incredibly powerful uh, force that shapes animal psychology in interesting ways that we can make conclusions about how psychology has changed in some animals. OK, and then just to tell you uh, really seriously, I'm not joking when I say that chimpanzees are not very good at this. Um, this is my uh, good friend Fifi, and I'm going to hide a grape. And this is the test where there's a novel cue. OK, where is it, guys? All right, so you can do this over and over. She scratches her head. You can do this over and over, and Fifi really is a chance, doesn't know where it is. All right, and then. For all the dog lovers, but sad for anybody who loves great apes, this goofy looking mutt who's never seen this problem before does the same thing. Ta da! Okay, and then we can look at the data just really quickly. Dogs actually do better than the chimpanzees, and I can tell you details of. Uh, it's, it's even worse than it looks. OK. So I wrote a paper together with my undergraduate um, advisor in 2005, basically human-like social skills in dogs. And we make the argument that dogs have actually converged on to have some of the psychological abilities we see in young children. Um, and we've been pursuing that ever since. And I've told you as well that our, what we're hoping is the more we study these things, that we're going to understand more how dogs not only how they're similar to us, but also the cognitive limitations that they experience when they're trying to help us work uh, and solve problems together. Because we're not just trying to make dogs little people. We also want to know what the limits of their cognitive abilities are as well, because that'll help trainers know you may not be able to train a dog 
um, to not make that mistake over and over. And so then you can navigate around it instead of trying to go through it. Um, and so these are all the types of crazy questions people are now asking about dogs. And dogs have become sort of the hot, exciting animal to study. Before 1998, before we got started studying dogs, actually nobody in the US studied dogs and studied dog psychology. And now Duke is the first to have the Duke Canine Cognition Center. And now uh, in Europe, there are several centers. And slowly in the United States, um, there are a number of groups. There's one at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and there are a couple of other places in the US that are considering uh, to study dogs. Um, and these are the types of questions, things like, are dogs capable of intentional deception? Some of you are absolutely nodding yes. Um, do dogs know uh, what you can see and what you can't see? Do they know what you know? Uh, do they understand symbols like children? Do they take shortcuts? How do they navigate? Uh, do different dog breeds differ, et cetera, et cetera? So the book I wrote, The Genius of Dogs, which is coming out next year, uh, tries to answer these questions based on the last 15 years of research on dog psychology. So uh, I'm going to stop there and say thank you. But before we, before we end, I just want to make one appeal to you. And I want to propose one idea. Um, and it was actually proposed to me by another alum. Um, which is that I was just thinking about how do you promote undergraduate research uh, together with this person. And they said, it would it be a great idea if for science there was something like the startup challenge here at Duke. It's been so successful in the business school. What if for undergraduates you did something similar? And it made me think of this website that I saw called Petri Dish. And actually, uh, one of my colleagues pointed it out to me because of this particular project. Um, uh, one of my colleagues is actually trying to understand the ancient DNA in dogs in Africa. But because this is sort of an untraditional project and it's going to have lots of undergraduate involvement, he's having difficulty attracting funds. So they made a YouTube video, they went to Petri Dish, and they proposed their idea. And they've raised $3,000. Uh, they need five more. Um, but the point is that this website is giving people the, the possibility to propose research and get non-traditional funding. And it just made me think, together um, with this person who actually suggested this, that um, what if Duke just did this on its own? What if we uh, had a way for undergraduates to propose research projects that alums or Duke, people in the Duke community could fund? Uh, and people could choose what to fund and what not to fund. Uh, and it could give us another way to have uh, exciting competition and ways to get non-traditional studies started and really inspire people to get involved early in their careers in science. So with that, now I really end and say thank you. Uh, and if anybody has any more questions. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.